Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Kimberly Kurka. Dr. K is a small animal veterinarian with over 23 years of experience after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania. She's worked in a variety of positions, including medical and hospital directly, in numerous hospitals, and has always enjoyed mentoring and supporting clients, staff, and veterinarians. She is especially calm and patient when it comes to working with frightened animals, especially cats. She is often being referred to as the cat whisperer. She has plenty of feline practical experience from her four cats at home, as well as having worked in a feline specialty practice. In the last five years, Dr. K has diversified her skills to include certified professional coaching, where she combines her love for veterinary medicine with her enthusiasm to help others under the auspices of Vetopia, Inc., Dr. K mentors new and recent veterinary graduates to help develop skills and facilitate success during the first few years in practice. She also coaches established veterinarians dissatisfied with their career or nearing burnout. Most recently, she's expanded her work supporting veterinarians to include veterinary outreach programs where veterinary medical teams, including technicians, assistants, and final year vet students, provide surgical and medical expertise to stray and underserved pet communities. Dr. K, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much. It's my honor and pleasure to be here with you today. Share with us a little bit about how you became passionate about cats and uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you actually did become the cat whisperer. I won't go back too, too far. However, I was one of those little girls that knew that she always wanted to be a veterinarian. I loved <laughs> animals from from a young age. And um, in some ways, that made life simple because I went undergraduate and did animal science pre-vet. I went to veterinary school and then started practicing as a small animal veterinarian. And really, I absolutely loved the career Initially, I think I was a little more a dog person. As a kid, I had begged my parents for a dog. But actually, I've been married now for too many years to count. But my husband and I have switched to having more cats and being more involved with cats. And I think the benefit of that is that when you live with cats, when you get to know different personalities, you become comfortable with working with cats. And so I've been able to extrapolate this comfort and and I guess some glimpses of more effective ways of working with cats into my medical practice. And often people comment that, wow, I can't believe you're able to do that with a cat. You're so good with a cat. And yes, uh, wow, you're the cat whisperer. So it's nice that I'm able to allow cats to feel a little more at ease in the veterinary hospital uh, because it can be a very stressful situation for them. Yeah, one thing that has become popular is fear-free treatment or, you know, a way to create an environment that is a little bit less stressful for cats. Are there any specific tips that you've discovered over the years that you'd like to share with us about how to make a visit to a veterinary practice a little bit more comfortable for our cats? Yeah, yeah. It was actually interesting um, because I did work at a cat-only specialty practice, and I was immediately struck by the fact that these cats seem to be so much calmer. Not to say that you didn't get a stressed out cat every now and then, but I think having either no barking dogs around or less barking dogs around, I don't know if the smell of dogs might be part to the stress, but I would suggest that, again, having separate waiting areas or at least be able to get the cats to a quieter type of calmer environment when they come into a hospital, if you can't do separate cat and dog areas, maybe also also have cat evenings or blocks of time if, again, the hospital is limited by um, how it can separate dogs and cats because I think that has just a very underlying uh, tone change. I do recommend if people can maybe not feed their cats before coming, sometimes maybe half of cats, not that many, but you can coax with some sort of treat or reward, and it does make the experience a little bit more pleasurable. 
And then some techniques that I think a lot of people comfortable with cats use, I've actually focused on, is cats are much more cooperative if they're allowed to be a little bit sternal or bunched up, kind of sitting on their legs. I will cut their nails in that fashion as opposed to laying them out and scruffing. Um, you know, if you just allow them to curl up, they usually will be fairly tolerant. So I think a less restraint, less grabbing by the scruff. You know, if someone grabbed me by the scruff, that would get my adrenaline going a little bit as well. So I think those are the main recommendations. And just going a little slower, I guess one last thing is when you know cats, it's totally fine that they express their discomfort with being in the hospital. I mean, that's normal. However, that does not mean all the time that they're going to eat you, bite you, attack you, and scratch you. And so if you're able to keep calm in that, allow them to keep safe, which is a little more curled up, they seem to love the scales. So so I'll do a lot of exams with them sitting on the scale, whatever kind of makes them feel a little more comfortable. And then as we get into the exam and they realize that maybe I'm not really going to be as threatening as they were worried about, then you can take them off the scale onto a mat or maybe work on their head and, and their face a little bit more if they were nervous. So patience and calmness, I think, and flexibility are the keys. Yeah, I think that there's been a lot of press that's come out relatively recently around the fact that scruffing is really not something that we should be doing, even when we're working with, you know, a semi-feral kitten or any cat at all. It's not something that really is beneficial, where in the past, I think we might have been trained that you want to be able to manage a cat and you scruff them. And I think that that is a trend that is going away. Yeah. I mean, I think it came from the fact that of wanting to keep the mouth away from your hand. I'm glad you brought it up. A lot of times just simply putting an e-collar on, that protects your hands, you know, they can't bite so well. So yeah, th that goes to the flexibility of how we can approach an animal. What tools do we have? A lot of people would simply roll up a towel and use that like, uh, you know, those whiplash collars. So again, the neck isn't able to turn quite so far back where your hands are examining. So there are a lot of options that are available if you take the time to familiarize yourself with them. So share a little bit with us your veterinary outreach program. This is a program projects that are outside of the United States or are they also inclusive in the United States? This is something that's kind of developed and snowballed and is the result of an opportunity I took advantage of. I collaborated with the SPCA in Fiji. They hadn't had a vet for a year and a half and they had a backload of surgeries. And I mentor and coach veterinarians and I thought what better situation than to maybe give experience, surgical and medical experience to new graduates or even externship fourth year students. And also, after the initial visit that I did, I realized it actually was an incredible tool for rejuvenating one's passion in the field. And so, again, it helps a bit with the veterinarians and staff that are feeling a little burnt out. But basically, what I am organizing are teams of vets, technicians, and students that go to Fiji and a few other places to provide veterinary care services spay neuter to underserved um, communities and stray populations and it's really it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody it's a win-win as, as I tell everybody so I'm working on expanding this and collaborating with a few other places I'm wanting to get a few more local in the United States so that it might be a long weekend or a weekend type procedure as opposed to we went for two weeks and spay neutered 500 animals so that was quite a big project but I think giving access to different lengths and types of programs is going to be a great opportunity for everybody and make a big benefit. That's great. That's wonderful. So when you went to Fiji, how many veterinarians went down with you? So the wonderful thing was we had six veterinarians. I had a lot more that wanted to come, but by the time you have to schedule vacation and all these types of things, but we had six veterinarians. The great thing is we represented four different countries. So we had three from the United States. We had one from Canada, one from the United Kingdom, and it turned out that there was a new vet grad from the Netherlands that was in Fiji when we were there at the SPCA, and she just decided to jump on board participated in the program as well. So that was one 
wonderful. We had two licensed technicians, which we can't do without. Every veterinarian knows that. They keep the ball rolling. And so they were very, very helpful. And we actually worked with the veterinary students and the Department of Agriculture in the local Fiji country. So it was a big, intensive situation. We we met wonderful people, collaborated with wonderful people, and like I said, really had a big impact on a lot of animals. It sounds like fun. Sounds busy, but sounds also like a lot of fun, and you felt like you really accomplished something. So that's great. I hope the program continues to grow. Hey, everybody, Stacy here with the Community Cats Podcast. And I just wanted to let everybody know that early bird ticketing is open for our 2020 online cat conference, which will be on January 24th through the 26th. So we will get together on the evening of the 24th with Chelsea White, who has a YouTube show that's perfectly awesome. And then we will be getting together on the 25th and the 26th for two full days of jam-packed information all about community community cats and community cat programs. So this is a virtual convention for anyone who'd like to help community cats. So this is the time to get signed up and join our online cat conference for the early bird ticket price of $50. So please go to onlinecatconference.com to sign up today. Also, if you'd like to become an affiliate as a fundraiser for your organization, the information is right there on the website, as well as sponsorship opportunities. So I hope you'll check it out. Go to www.onlinecatconference.com and we look forward to seeing you then. Hey everyone, Hooch and I are here today to talk about Dr. Elsie's cat litter. Dr. Elsie's cat litter is known to be the best litter on the market and Hooch agrees. Many of you know that Hooch was a foster cat of mine that I adopted while at the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. We did use the Touch of Outdoors litter as we transitioned him from being an indoor-outdoor kitty to an indoor-only kitty. I'm thrilled that Hooch found his home with me, but there were many times when folks would call me saying their kitty didn't use the litter box. I was also thrilled that Dr. Elsie's Cat Attract litter came out as it gave me a resource to share with others that was affordable and in most cases successful in keeping this kitty in their home. As a special benefit to Community Cats podcast listeners, Dr. Elsie's is offering a rebate up to $20 off your first bag of any Dr. Elsie's litter. Just visit drelsies.com forward slash Community Cats podcast to print your rebate or fill out the online form. Try Dr. Elsie's today and you won't regret it. So tell me a little bit about your experience in becoming a certified professional coach. What does that really mean? In veterinary medicine, there is a big burnout, incidence of burnout and suicide. And if it's not that extreme, it can just manifest as job dissatisfaction, toxic work environment, and depression. This is probably not unique to veterinary medicine, but do have for the professions a high rate of suicide. And so I decided that given my own mental burnout scenario, where I became depressed and really wasn't happy with where I was working, I had an epiphany that, you know what, it's not veterinary medicine, it's actually my circumstances and how many people are changing careers, committing suicide, having mental illness, when in actual fact, there are a lot of opportunities and tools that one can use to create the circumstances that you desire and without having to go to the alternatives. And so I became certified as a professional coach so that I can coach veterinarians who aren't happy. I would say, as I mentioned earlier in our pre-talk, the more I I get into this, the more I'm realizing that it's also happening with technicians, of course, and rescue organizations and shelters. And, you know, if people in this field are incredibly compassionate and passionate about caring and helping animals, sometimes resources can be limited, days long. And so we all can suffer from mental and physical anguish, you know, long term. And so coaching is a way of supporting and helping an individual individual make changes to their life and situation in order to get the results they want, whether that's continuing in the field um, in a different way or changing the self-growth period where we, we sort things out. So I find it very rewarding to be able to offer those services. And I know a lot of people have really turned around their circumstances. Why do you think that we have this mental health issue in animal welfare? 
I think for a couple reasons. I think the type of individual that's attracted to caring, helping, saving animals really comes from a deep-rooted passion, and we enjoy it. But what happens is, with time, when you put 220% in, you leave yourself very little time to recharge, to diffuse, and it feels fine for a while, but the balance sometimes is lost just due to our enthusiasm, but that can backfire on us. So I think that that's one of the things. I think that we also tend to be, at least in the veterinary field, perfectionists. And we want things done to an incredibly steep bar. And so sometimes having, again, some flexibility where we're not forcing ourselves and circumstances that we might not be so in control of. You know, if you're working at a hospital and you're not the boss making the decisions, then you only have so much control. If you're a rescue that, you know, is reliant on funding or something to do certain aspects while one does their best to get funding, there's limited control. So I think that there's some weaknesses in the structure and the type of people that come to the field. But then I think there also needs to be conscientious ways of relieving the pressure, the tension, acknowledging it, and creating a support system. It's really prevalent. I mean, it's unfortunate. I see so many things on social media of people in the field having problems and it's a real mystery on how to help folks. And we have a tremendous shortage. We have a shortage of veterinarians. We have a shortage of technicians, which adds to the stress as well as, you know, in the nonprofit space, it's not a, a particularly high paid space. And in most situations, being an animal care technician, unfortunately, is probably not a very well compensated position in general. I wish that were different. So there's financial stresses along with all the animal stress that we see. And I still see it in shelters that we would call no-kill shelters, as well as what we would call traditional shelters. I do think that compassion fatigue is prevalent in all kinds of animal care, not just, you know, in a facility that might be euthanizing a lot of animals, which I certainly think is extremely stressful and very difficult, but that there are other stresses that might play a role there. I don't know what you're seeing in veterinary practice, but that's sort of what I'm seeing in the sheltering world. Yeah. One of the things, though, that has struck me is there's always going to be more. And I think where we can support ourselves in this field is to celebrate more intensely our successes. So, you know, one goes to a community to trap and release a bunch of cats. And maybe we estimate the population to be X, but we only did Y. But we see it in that light. We wanted to get them all, but we only did Y. But instead, really celebrating the Y. What an accomplishment that was. And acknowledging, you know, that we've benefited so many animals, that we've reduced their ability to contribute to pet overpopulation. And so I think that sometimes just taking a minute to reframe and celebrate actually the accomplishment instead of of criticizing and focusing on, we did this much, but, you know, so I think that that would be one very helpful example of how we can keep a positive light and recharge in the field. Dr. K, if there are folks that are interested in finding out more about the work that you do, how would they reach out to you? Oh, great. Thank you for asking. I have a website, which is primarily my coaching, but it does have some outreach on there, www.vettopia.com. It's not an underscore, it's a dash. Uh, my email, though, is Dr. K, so D-R-K at, again, vettopia-inc.com. I'm also Facebook at Mentoring Vets or Vetopia Inc. So um, there's a picture of me on there. There is a, a blue one that's not supposed to be there. I've got to get that off, but you'll see a picture of a lady in a, a white and green dress. So that's me. But feel free. I'd be happy to hear about what everybody else is doing, uh, to brainstorm, to help in any way that I can with your audience, because there's such a valuable asset and tool for the cat community, and you guys really do a wonderful job. Dr. K, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Um, no, no. I really, I encourage them and I thank them for all their hard work. And if there are any tools or ideas that they've experienced that help with resilience and longevity in this occupation, and um, I'd appreciate any feedback and comments. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. 
Well, thank you again for joining me today, Dr. K. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future as you expand to other parts of the country and other countries. I'd love to hear how the veterinary outreach programs are going for you. And I also think the coaching that you do is really extremely important for shelter medicine veterinarians as well as obviously private practice veterinarians and their technicians and pretty much anybody that's in the field of taking care of animals. I appreciate your efforts and I appreciate what you're doing and setting up because I do think it's a a tremendously important and valuable service. Oh, my pleasure. And I'd love to speak to you again. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. Wow.